yeah, th there was definitely a couple of seconds after that question ended where I thought this might be, I might be about to blow it here. Welcome to Jonathan Gibson, the newly crowned mastermind champion 2021. Congratulations, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Gareth. It's uh, I'm, I'm still, you know, feeling slightly, uh, uh, slightly like it, like it's not real, but it's finally beginning to sink in now. Um, and it's, it feels pretty good. So the last week must have been a bit of a whirlwind. Can, can you tell us about some of those moments of kind of, you know, you could have expected some but other things which are just sideswiped you? Um, well, I think really uh, the media attention on Tuesday was just so manic that I, yeah, it it did feel like sort of being in being in a film or or a TV show. Um, and then on Wednesday, I basically just slept most of the day. Uh, okay. But really, Thursday and Friday were the most enjoyable days because then I just started replying to all the lovely uh, comments and messages that I'd I'd got on on Monday night and Tuesday morning that I hadn't been able to respond to before including one actually from the actor who played the commissioner of Poirot's apartment in, oh, okay. uh, in the Poirot series, who was actually one of the questions that I got right in my special subject round. Oh, awesome. So that was, that was really amazing because he's, he's in his 90s now and had actually, um, one of the anecdotes in the email was that he had also seen Flanders and Swan playing at the Fortune Theatre on their first, uh, first drop of the hat tour. Um, so that was, that was pretty, pretty amazing and definitely not something I'd expected. But the, the messages have all been universally lovely. Yeah, and I saw, um, obviously, you were on Gogglebox and uh, and you commented that you'd never been described as a rude boy before. So, uh, you know, <laughs> life achievement unlocked. No, I, I, I didn't mind that nickname at all. I think uh, <laughs> hopefully that might stick. So, you know, now you kind of, you have the title, but you also have this kind of uh, uh, moniker that, you know, the youngest ever mastermind champion um which gavin fuller has wielded proudly for quite some time and, and now that's yours um are you kind of thinking i quite like to hang on for that to that for a while or can you see some other people coming who might just take that from you i can absolutely see some people um sort of up and coming who were uh, who've started quizzing at a much younger age mm. or quizzing seriously at a much younger age than than i had and uh i mean like Sean Webb would be would be an obvious name who is like you know four years younger than me I think mm. and uh, I could absolutely see him uh, doing very well on Mastermind in the in the immediate future but it would be lovely to hang on to it for at least a couple of years <laughs> and I, yeah. I'm not going to be protectionist about it because I'm I'm just really proud to be part of an amazing generation of quizzers and uh, mm. and it it would be it would be great to see some more um, people in their twenties coming up and and winning sort of um, Prime time quiz shows absolutely um in terms of you know winning winning something like mastermind at 24 doesn't just come out of thin air um your kind of upbringing your family upbringing was there a lot in that in terms of uh, a love of learning encouragement to read stuff like that which gave you a real grounding um that helped you then become a quizzer I think yeah, I think that's definitely true. That um, my my parents aren't really big um, big quizzers themselves in terms of you know taking it further than watching Quizzy Mondays and shouting out answers. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think they definitely encouraged me to read from a really early age. I think that I would give quite a bit of credit to the Lemony Snicket series of unfortunate events mm. books, which uh, I absolutely loved. I very much identified with with Klaus Baudelaire, the uh, the uh, the son in in those books. And one of the things that I loved about them was just that they'd occasionally sort of go off topic and drop in random uh, general knowledge facts or introducing new words or uh, just, you know, fun facts apropos of nothing. And I um, something about my brain just sort of latched on to, uh, to those, those fun facts. So, I, yeah, I, I don't know if it, if it was nature or nurture, but I, I certainly have to give a lot of credit to, to my parents and to my uh, my teachers who who all really sort of supported this uh, kind of pursuit of knowledge for its own sake which I've stuck with um, through all my life really. When did you kind of turn loving knowledge into loving giving answers to things? Was that at school or university? Um, well I, I suppose it started really with um, something called the school's challenge quiz tournament which I, I don't know how many people on the quiz circuit um, did this when they were at school I think it was only quite a 
small number of schools that did it, which is a shame because it's, it's a great competition. Um, but basically, it's been going since I think the 70s or 80s, and it's it's got the same format as University Challenge with um, starters and bonuses. But um, but our school did that, and I competed for like six years running. And I, I still remember, I, I mentioned this in one of my newspaper interviews earlier in the week, but um, in my uh, second year at senior school, it was just announced at assembly that um, if you wanted to take part in the school's challenge quiz, go to Mr. Welsh's class firm at, at break time for, for tryouts. And turning up to, to those tryouts at the age of 12, having been absolutely useless at sport and, and not, a, not a really outstanding uh, academic performer up to that point, um, I, I was just amazed to find something that I thought I was unusually good at and where I could mm. take on people who are older than me and, and beat them and actually mm. impress people by, by knowing things. And that was quite a new experience and I, I just loved it. So you found your home there and then when you went to university, um, you must have been thinking, right, University Challenge is my target here. Absolutely, yes. Uh, that was... Um, I mean, I, I won't lie, it was a large part of the reason why I was drawn to, to Magdalen College at, at Oxford, knowing that they they held the, the joint record at that time and, and still for, uh, mm. for the most university challenge wins. Um, I think, the although the slightly unusual thing, I suppose, about my quiz journey is that compared to a lot of other young British quizzers my age, I didn't do all that much quiz bowl at, okay. at, at Oxford. There were, there were loads of opportunities and I kind of regret not taking more advantage of them. But I think that, um, I mean, it, partly because I had had already by that stage quite a long quizzing career at school mm. and I'd sort of got used to sort of being the star and buzzing in all the time to suddenly find myself at that um, sort of um, slightly immature age surrounded by loads of people who were clearly much better than me. I sort of, I guess, slightly petulantly thought, well, if I if I can't win, then it just isn't my format. And it's, mm. uh, I didn't really want to put the effort in to try and get better at it at that stage. Um, so, so yeah, I, I kind of feel now that I've got quite a lot of ground to make up, particularly in my, my highbrow knowledge mm. to, uh, uh, to make up for, for that uh, sort of neglect of, of quiz bowl at, at university. But, but yeah, no, I, I definitely still loved quizzing in in pub quizzes mm. and watching university challenge with my friends and and preparing to mm. to go on that in my in my last year uh, but it was it was really only after i left oxford uh, that i really discovered the world of quizzing outside tv mm. really and uh, was introduced to the the quiz league circuit and really fell in love with quizzing more than i'd ever thought possible before and then at some point um, you decided I'm going to have a go at Mastermind. What was it that made you think, you know, I'm going to put myself through this ordeal at such a, a young age? Um, well, I suppose it was, it was partly that I'd been, I've been thinking about it for a couple of years before I applied, mm. but I, I'd always sort of thought, well, I've got too much else on this year that I wouldn't be able to commit mm. the, the necessary amount of time to it and then just for whatever reason in my in my first year of my PhD I think on a morning when I was slightly hung over and in bed at, at half 11 in the morning I just thought you know why not I, I'd I'd probably quite enjoy giving this a go um, because by that stage I had sort of I, I had got into the UK quiz league circuit and had sort of mm. seen my name on sort of UK wide leaderboards. So I had more of a sense of, mm. of where I was as a quizzer compared to um, the best in the country. Um, and I, I thought, yeah, may maybe I could, I could do okay at this. Mm. Maybe, so was that your ambition to do okay, to not kind of embarrass yourself, but to give it a go and see how it was? Or, or did you secretly harbor you know, well, I really want to get to the semis or I'd really like to get to the final. I'd, I'd sort of gone in thinking that if I went out in the heat, I'd be a bit embarrassed. But if I if I got to the semis, I'd I'd be able to uh, to watch it and uh, and feel OK about it, because so many amazing quizzers have just got really unlucky in the semis mm. and uh, and gone out there like Evan Lynch last year or uh, Tim Hall and Ashton Davis this year. Mm. So I, I didn't think there'd be any shame in that. 
Um, but getting through the heats was my was my primary ambition, not least because I was mm. doing sort of my sort of my favorite specialist subject in the world as mm. my uh, as my subject, and I really didn't want to mess that up. <laughs> yeah, did you feel a, a responsibility? to the subject matter when you picked it. Um, I know I did, at least in one of my subjects, that I felt, actually, I really need to do this justice, not for me, but for, for the subject mm. itself. Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I am the first to confess, I am like a, a sort of Trekkie level fan of, of Agatha Christie's Poirot. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I did feel a certain level of, of responsibility um, to, to try and not get, get anything wrong. Because I, I hadn't seen, the TV show be a specialist subject on the show before, mm. and uh, and and yeah, I, I just wanted to do my fellow Agatha Christie fans proud. Mm. And it's a big subject, Poirot. Mm. How did you go about preparing yourself for something where you can have all the different plot points? And it was a TV version, wasn't it, as well that you were doing? So not just plot points, you could potentially have cast crew location how did you go about mastering something which it, 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 when i talk about it like that it's ridiculously broad how, how did you go about it um well i i think i was lucky in a sense that that was the one the producers chose to go first mm. and lucky also that the filming got delayed by a few months so i had the the full summer with not much else to do in terms of uh, my academic work mm. um so i could i could really just devote time to doing that yeah. I think really I just watched every episode and while I was watching I had a sort of my, I had my notes app open mm. at the other side of the screen and every time something was mentioned that that sounded like it could be an answer line mm. I'd write it down and then after watching the episode I'd go through that list and make a flashcard for each one of them mm. um so so yeah I think I ended up with about 3000 ish flashcards mm. overall um and and then just uh just took about a week and a half or so to uh to run through them as many times as i could before before mm. the filming was there a particular flashcard app you used i used uh, i used quizlet for my my specialist subject revision mm. because i think I, I use Anki for my general knowledge revision because that's better mm. at getting things to stick in your head in the long term. Mm. And I think um, Quizlet is a bit better for just uh, just kind of powering through loads and loads of flashcards in one go mm. to, to cram a subject really quickly. Interesting. Um, I think flashcards were in their infancy when I last did uh, Mastermind, but I still use them. But um, things like Anki and whatever were not even around. so. It's amazing how the world moves on to help help the quizzer. Um, did you find anything from your university challenge experience that kind of helped you in your mastermind experience? Um, well, yeah, I, I think to some extent, being a bit more comfortable not worrying about being on TV, sort mm -hmm. of having gone through that that process of 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 filming something and then mm -hmm. seeing yourself on TV and and that kind of disconnect between how you sort of feel that you're coming across in your head and how you actually come across on on screen so i think i was much less nervous about watching the broadcasts this time mm. than i would have been if i'd never been on tv before mm. um in terms of preparing i think that i think i prepared a lot better for mastermind than i than i did for university challenge mm. Partly because I, I'd really aimed to be on University Challenge my second year when mm. famously Oxford history students have nothing to do. Like we have no exams in second year. Um, so, so that had been the, the game plan for, for that to be my, my primary occupation in second year. But we ended up getting on my third year when I was right in the middle of writing my thesis. Mm. So, uh, so really I, I could have revised for, for University Challenge a lot more effectively than I did. Um, and I, I think they are they are quite different shows, both mm. in terms of the format and the the level of general knowledge that they mm. uh, that they require. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it was more to do with the the filming and broadcasting mm. experience that that Universal Challenge helped. Yeah, having been through that before and known there's there's a lot of waiting around and there's a lot of you know a lot of downtime in the in the recording process that it. Um, and then all of a sudden you're into the hurly burly of 
of filming that if you've been through that once then it doesn't come as a surprise the next time you've done it so it's useful in that respect yeah um so you you did um poirot we know you did flanders and swan in the final uh, because there was a kind of a a childhood um memory of it and connection to your dad what did you do in the semi-finals it was uh, William Pitt the Younger. That's my right. Subject, which was one of the subjects that I'd I'd put forward in my original five on that morning when I was a bit hungover and was just sort of coming up with things from off the top of my head. But I was I was quite happy that that I ended up getting a chance to uh, to to do it in the end because um, it was it was based on a book that my school history teacher had had lent me when I was like fourteen and was one of the really important books that. That made me think I would quite like to to write about and research history mm. in in the longer term. Um, so it was just a thrill, really, to to revisit that book, having not read it in in such a long time, and to sort of pay tribute to to that teacher and and to all my mm. to all my school teachers in in some sort of way. But it, it really wasn't planned that that all three of my subjects were sort of unofficial tributes to uh, to sort of formative influences from my my early life. I know it's starting to sound like kind of Slumdog Mastermind or something mm. with the, all these references, but no, it's great because I think there's there's always having that hook, that thing that keeps you going when when doing a specialist subject can start to feel like a bit of a chore if you've got some sort of affinity for it and must help. Um, your semi final, you had a perfect game. Mm. Um, nailing your, your specialist subject is one thing nailing general knowledge when you could have anything thrown at you is is quite another did you do any particular work on general knowledge or was it really just years of quizzing and learning coming to fruition i i think it was just really that cumulative process of having done so many quizzes and particularly in the last few years having adopted i think a much better attitude to to quizzing than i than i had in the past where you focus much more on the questions you're getting wrong and thinking about, okay, why did I get that wrong this time? How can I make sure that I, I get that or a similar question right the next time? Um, so I, I think that that sort of long-term uh, cumulative effort rather than any particular last minute cramming was, uh, was more, more important. And also obviously a lot of luck in terms of getting the perfect general knowledge set that, you know, that definitely wouldn't have happened in uh, like, uh, Trying to think of, of percentages but you know 90 97 percent of, of any other general knowledge sets that, that i could have got mm, yeah i mean luck is always a part of a quiz where there's a relatively small number of questions um nonetheless you still have to answer them correctly and you did which got you into the final uh, mm -hmm. where you had a number of um known competitors and a few kind of um relatively new to to, to the scene and to the grand final coming off the back of a perfect game and looking at the at the the grand final did you reassess your expectations did you realize that people were now going to be thinking you're the favorite um mm. going into this and did you feel any pressure of that uh well yeah to, to some extent because that was definitely something that the producers were clearly emphasizing when they were filming my vt making so much of of my semi-final performance and also talking so much about the potential to be the youngest ever winner um, and, and having had experience of quizzing, I, I know, as, as I'm sure you'll empathise with, that sometimes it's the games that you don't expect to win where you end up pulling it out of the bag, yeah. whereas it's, it's often the, the ones where you don't really know the other, the other uh, competitors that well and, and think that, that you, you maybe, it maybe won't be as much work that, mm -hmm. where you end up messing it up and, and embarrassing yourself. So. Yeah, the, the feeling of of maybe going in as, as the favourite wasn't necessarily an entirely positive or comforting thing psychologically. And interestingly, on Twitter in the last day or so, somebody posed a question of uh, what's the scariest chair, and I put, oh, the mastermind black chair. Interestingly, you put, it's not the mastermind black chair, it's the one in the contestant's row when you're waiting to go in the black chair and you're watching other people... Um, perform and you yeah. were last on in the second round and so you saw Dan push that total out to 24 were you feeling the feeling pressure at that point did you think I've, I've got to have a good game here I can't afford one of those kind of uh, stop start um, rounds 
that was definitely the scariest moment, particularly as I really didn't know Dan at all by reputation when we filmed the final. And I, I really hadn't expected him to, to pull such an incredible general knowledge round out of, uh, out of the bag like that. So, so yeah, seeing him do so well, definitely, um, it, it, that definitely sort of raised my, my heart rate to a, to a level that it, it hadn't reached in the, in the previous games. Mm. But, uh, go, sorry, carry on. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the interesting thing about Mastermind is that I think it's really the only quiz format for when, for the vast majority of the time, you don't actually get a chance to to interrupt or to uh, to try to answer anyone else's questions. You're just sort of sitting there watching your opponents accumulating points, not being able to do anything to stop them. So that is, um, yeah, so, so that that did add to the, uh, the, the nerve lacking factor. Hmm. And you didn't have at any point the experience of sat there waiting, watching somebody thinking, are they going to beat my total and seeing them edge closer and then tie and then mm -hmm. go past. So you're saved from that. You'll, you'll never have to experience yeah, that. I would, I would have enjoyed <laughs> that even less. Um, but when it came to that final round, you, you went into the chair, you, you answered questions fluently. There weren't many mistakes um, or questions you didn't get wrong. Um, Clearly, you had um, a, a no pass strategy. I would have thought, mm. by the look of it, um, you didn't seem to have any idea of how well you'd done at the end of that round. Mm. No, <laughs> so not, when, not at all. So when John Humphreys uh, and he did prolong it a bit before telling you um, your score, mm. and we saw that kind of emotional reaction. It really was a surprise to you. Was was it that you'd won not not just one, but one by a nice clear margin? Absolutely. Yeah, because um, I had, because I, I, I knew that I'd got 17 questions in my heat and my semi-final. So knowing that Dan was 13 points ahead of me, I was, I was sort of working on the basis that I needed to get no more than three questions wrong. Mm. Um, because, um, yeah, uh, to, to win. So when I got my third question wrong, and I, I didn't really know how much time I, I had left, although it turned out by that point I'd already won. Um, I, I did start sort of worrying a bit, and particularly with the, the final question being something that I didn't really know. Hmm. It started out which German philosopher and revolutionary, which made me think it's probably Marx. Hmm. Then it was something about his wife, which was a, a fact that I didn't know, and there was like a 10% chance that it might have been Engels. So, uh, yeah, th there was definitely a couple of seconds after that question ended where I thought this might be, I might be about to blow it here. Mm. I might be about to, to end up in a tiebreak or, 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 even, uh, or even throwing it away completely if I, if I lost a couple of questions. Um, so, 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 yeah, at, at that point, I really had no idea if I'd, if I'd won, lost or, uh, or tied. So it's an entirely kind of genuine and spontaneous reaction in the chair and then when you got back to the contestants row, I mean, it must be a feeling of immense kind of elation and relief and all sorts of things kind of washing over you at that point. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, elation and relief are, are probably the, the best two words. Yeah. So um, just looking at your performance, just one more bit about it. One thing that was a hallmark, and again, you were thinking about the number of questions you had was uh, your speed of answering that you you know you were there with the answer as as quickly as as you were allowed to to get in mm. um but i've also known uh, you've done really well on speed quizzing during mm. lockdown is is that speed of recall just something that's inherent in you or was it kind of particularly a, a tactic for mastermind that you just wanted to get as many questions as you possibly could Oh, well, yeah, I've been thinking a bit about this um, after watching the episodes, and I, I'd maybe credit it in part to the Schools Challenge quizzes that we were talking about earlier, because, like, really the big difference between Schools Challenge and University Challenge was that the starter questions were really short, mm. like, um, you know, seven or eight words, like mm. half a line, basically. Mm. Um, so in that, pretty much every starter was a buzzer race, and uh, and you had to get very used to anticipating the questions as as sort of tightly as you possibly could mm. so I suppose having so much practice at speed mm. at um and, and speed on on relatively accessible questions mm. at at that early an age that probably was quite good practice for um for formats like mastermind and like um speed quiz mm. 
nowadays and really having having sort of built up deeper reserves of, of general knowledge I've been able to apply the sort of older um, tactics of, of speed of recall to uh, uh, to more and more knowledge. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's it was it fan, it worked fantastically for you. You managed um, more questions um, in each of the two rounds in the grand final than the opposition, mm. and you know that kind of not wasting a, a heartbeat really does pay dividends in that um, in those regards. So you've won it. You've you've got the media maelstrom that's kind of followed, and and the reaction has been kind of extremely positive. I don't remember. Um, mastermind resonating with with the media and the general public quite in the way it has in this period of time so it must be really really enriched the experience for it to be received so well it, it really has it's been it's been so surprising and I, I think it must have something to do with with lockdown and everyone sort of generally feeling a bit uh burnt out by the last mm. by the last year and a bit and uh and still not really having much else to do but but watch tv of an evening yeah. Um, and comments on Twitter, um, but but yeah, it's it's been really it's been really incredible to to see so many people from from all different walks of life um, sort of responding positively to uh, to a quiz show. Having having loved quiz for so much time and having been a bit you know disappointed and saddened in the past to see other quizzes and other quiz shows getting slightly more hostile or or mm. just completely irrelevant uh, comments made about them mm. on on social media. And I mean, I'd hope that this is a sign of a general step in the right direction in terms of how quizzes are perceived on, on television and on social media, rather than, you know, just just a fluke to do with something about me. Well, we, we can but hope. Um, we know that there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of trolling that does go on, but equally, you know, I think quizzes are more and more stepping up to kind of defend their own and 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 stop that sort of thing happening. So that's that's hopefully driving the trend in the right direction. The, the question now, I guess, is where next for you? And when we were on Quizzy Monday, you said, well, I've got to kind of get my life balance <laughs> sorted out again. Um, you got a PhD and, and all that. Um, but you did talk about perhaps at least one, one quiz ambition that, that is still out there. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Well, I, th I think that the, the other quiz that I'd, I'd still really love to do in the uh, sort of public broadcast arena would be Brain of Britain, because I, I have been a massive fan of Brain of Britain for ages. I think that the balance of, of questions, the balance of topics ought to suit my um, my personal range relatively well. So so yeah, I'd, I'd definitely love to have a go at that, ideally before I'm 30. Mm. Um, and, uh, and that's another one where you can keep going on as as many times as you like really yeah. so that's uh uh yeah so I, i'd have no expectation of of how i do on on the first occasion but i'd, I'd certainly love to have a go at it in the next mm. uh next four or five years and have you ever competed in the world championships because i'm thinking of jesse honey a similarly mm. young um, winner from a few years ago who went on to win the world championship could could the world be at your feet as well um, oh, I, I don't know about that. I think that from the past papers in the World Championships that I've I've looked at, I, I think they um, they quite often test um, levels of depth that I, I'm not sure I I'm quite able to compete at yet, mm. particularly in terms of international knowledge, because mm. I feel like so much of my own quiz knowledge is just based on watching UK uh, TV quiz shows mm. and uh, sort of building up knowledge from from those. Whereas I, I think that. I would need to do quite a bit more work on uh, general global knowledge to to get the holistic breadth and depth that, that's required for the world championships. But you know, somewhere down the line, and I, I, I I'm still really committed to constantly improving at, at quizzing. So uh, so yeah, may, maybe maybe sometime, but not in the in the well. Future. You have a, a good few years um, ahead of you to to enable you to kind of plot and plan your way to the global crown if that's what you want to do but also good luck with brain of britain it really does feel like it's something that would would suit you um at this point i just want to say congratulations once more jonathan i mean I think when when we saw your first round and you performed so strongly i said on all things quiz that that's a potential champion um when we saw your semi-final i don't think there was anyone in any doubt 
but you still have to go on and perform when the, the, the toughest of pressure is is on you and you did and you're an extremely worthy winner and um, everyone is delighted for you um, and not just people who've met you or met or quizzed against you but casual people so congratulations enjoy the next year while you while you wear this crown and and you know you'll forever be a mastermind champion anyway but um but enjoy this particular year it's your year and best of luck for the future thank you so much it's it's been it's been such an exciting experience and i i look forward to uh to staying in the quiz community for a long time to come <laughs>